So what kind of paranormal experiences can a person have visiting some of the most notoriously haunted locations in the U.S.? From Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum in West Virginia to the St. Augustine Lighthouse in Florida, Hell's Bardem in Tennessee, the Lizzie Borden House in Massachusetts, the Velisca Axe Murder House and Malvern Manor, both in Iowa, and the West Virginia State Penitentiary. My next guest is Christy Sumner, a paranormal investigator and founder of Soul Sisters Paranormal. She and her team have visited and investigated all of these locations and many more, and she joins me to talk about her experiences and some of the amazing paranormal evidence her team has captured at these known paranormal hotspots on this episode of Passion for the Paranormal. Okay, so uh, joining me tonight is Dr. Christy Sumner, and uh, Christy uh, coupled her passion for travel history and the paranormal when she formed Soul Sisters Paranormal, an all-female paranormal team made up of her, her two sisters, and two friends. As a team of five investigators, uh, Soul Sisters has traveled to some of the most haunted historic locations in the U.S., in an attempt to determine for themselves whether or not there's something to ghosts and to highlight the rich history at these uh, various locations. Her team has uh, traveled to and investigated many famous paranormal hotspots, including the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum in West Virginia, the Lizzie Borden House in Massachusetts, the Vliska Axe Murder House in Iowa, the St. Augustine Lighthouse in Florida, Brushy Mountain State Paranormal, Ten Tennessee, and uh, many other locations in, in, as well. In uh, 2020, Christy and her twin sister carried on their journey as just a two-person team. And uh, Christy holds a PhD in public affairs with an emphasis on criminal justice. Uh, was a director for a registered travel company focused on biometric clearances for, tra for the traveling public. And was also a college professor at Metro State College of Denver and the University of Central Florida, where she, she is currently a director. And uh, Christy, it's so great to have you joining me tonight. Uh, thank you for uh, stopping by to talk with me. Absolutely, thank you for having me, I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, you know, I visited the website. Uh, I've looked at the many great locations you guys have traveled to. Many of these locations are on my bucket list. And, uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, before we get into some of this good stuff about these locations and things that have happened, some of your experiences, let's step back a bit. Let's hear your story from how this started out mm -hmm. and uh, how you got into this crazy world of the paranormal. <laughs> Absolutely. So it actually started for us as a girls trip. Um, my sisters and I would live in different parts of the country and we would routinely get together to go and have girls weekends, you know, in different cities, just kind of meet up several times a year just to kind of see each other. And in 2014, we were going to Moundsville, West Virginia, which is where the West Virginia State Penitentiary is located. And we had a family friend that sat on the board of that facility. And he said, while you're here, why don't you stay the night in the penitentiary one of those nights and see if you can communicate with any of our resident spirits. So we jumped at that opportunity. It was a very rudimentary investigation for us. But we always said if we had the opportunity to go on a paranormal investigation, we'd do it. So we went to West Virginia State Penitentiary and we had a few voice recorders, a couple of cameras with us. Um, and what we experienced that night was so compelling that we decided that we wanted to really delve into this further. And to the best of our ability, uh, take this subculture and elevate it into a more professional mainstream if we could. And that's why, you know, we formed Soul Sisters Paranormal. We, you know, trademarked our logo, uh, theme music, all of that to really give a legitimate appearance to what we're doing. Um, all of my sister, my both my sisters uh, and I have uh, ad advanced degrees and we ha we come from a research minded background. So we wanted to see if we could use that to really um, see if there is something to to paranormal and paranormal phenomena. And, you know, I love that because I always like to see people like you in the paranormal field who have, you know, some credibility. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you've come from a, you know, obviously you mentioned you have a PhD. Uh, you know, people tend to, when you have a background like yours, they tend to, you know, pay attention a little bit more. Uh, and uh, I think what you just said is so important for this field to bring some credibility to it. Uh, you know, a lot of people see the TV shows and they think that that's kind of the reality. 
<laughs> what happens out there. I'm also a paranormal investigator, been doing this for a number of years. And I think we quickly find when we get into this, it just, uh, that's not quite the reality of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but did you uh, have any kind of paranormal experiences as a kid? You know, um, did you have any at an early age or how, what ultimately made you interested in taking a journey doing this? Well, we always had a belief in the paranormal. My my parents were very good at allowing us to form our own belief system. Um, you know, I, I will say I am a Christian. I come from that type of a background. But, you know, we've always had the pretty much the innate feeling that there is something after this. Uh, you know, if you believe that energy cannot be created or destroyed and that we're made up of energy, you have to go. You have to believe that we're going somewhere after we pass. So it was always one of those things that we we always had a feeling that there is something out there. Um, and we did start watching the popular television shows of the early you know 2000s taps and ghost adventures and stuff um but to your point it it really felt like it was a sensationalism type of of media right so you know we knew that you couldn't go in there and have experiences every place that you go and and when you did have those experiences why are you running out of that location or um you know why aren't you trying different techniques and such like that and so while we watched those we would say to ourselves well, why didn't they do this or why didn't they ask that question or why didn't they try this technique and that's really kind of what propelled us to go into this field once we had that experience at west virginia state penitentiary um again for us it was just one of those really interesting happenstances that we had that connection to to get into that prison um and our and it was kind of interesting also because our grandpa was a prison guard at moundsville uh, while it was in operation as a penitentiary so we did have that familial connection there as well um but it really did open our eyes to something that we were very compelled to study further i.e the paranormal that that's uh, interesting and i kind of came from a different angle than a lot of people that have come into this field that like a skeptical mm -hmm. um background or or viewpoint if you will and when i say skeptical i don't mean that i completely dismiss the paranormal it's just that i had not experienced it for myself and mm -hmm. uh, i don't a lot of people that had experiences uh and, and you know people that i didn't consider were crazy or you know, had any sort of mental issues or anything like that. So, right. uh, you know, I, I always, and then, you know, the shows came on and uh, I think I, you know, the first show I really watched was Ghost Hunters, um, you know, with Jason and Grant, mm -hmm. you know, I followed that show and some of the follow on shows got a little bit more dramatic, if you will. But I always in the back of my mind thought, well, what if there is something to this? So I don't know if it was similar for you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Or maybe you can tell us when you had that first paranormal experience. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, and we're we're sort of of the same mindset in that every location that we go into, we go in with a healthy skepticism. Even though we've experienced so many different things, you know, we go in with the mindset of let's see if we can find environmental factors first that are causing the quote unquote haunting experiences in this location. So the very first thing that we do is we go in to a location during the day and we take very copious notes on that location. Where is the train? Where's the train traffic? Where's the airline traffic? Where's the vehicular traffic? Street lights, dogs in the neighborhood, kids in the neighborhood. And we make note of all of that. So if we experience that during our nighttime investigation, we can very quickly rule that out as not being paranormal. Um, when we control for all of those factors, factors and we find something that we cannot explain during our investigation, then we call that unexplainable. Um, things that you know we've controlled for, but yet we're hearing these voices or seeing these light anomalies that we can't account for by any other means. Uh, and so honestly, the very first uh, experience that we had was in that first investigation in Moundsville. Uh, we there was there was a small group of females in that investigation, and we were hearing footsteps. We were hearing men's voices. We were hearing cell door slamming when we knew that there was nobody in that cell block. So it couldn't be anything, you know, physically living that was causing that phenomena to occur. And as I said, we really came out of that experience with a a want to explore this further. And I, I think that we've done um, a, a very interesting, we've had a very interesting journey so far in the locations that we've visited because we have come across anomalies that we just can't explain. Yeah, and uh, these uh, locations, I mean, there's, there's several paranormal hotspots. Uh, they've been featured on shows. Many mm -hmm. of these you guys have investigated. 
was that part of kind of the motivation here? Did you want to kind of go behind some of these famous locations and say, let's uh, let's really, you know, be strict about our process here and uh, let's see what we really capture and uh, see if there's really something to it. I mean, was the were the shows kind of a, a motivation for that? What was the motivation? Was it really about the attractiveness of these locations? What kind of drove you to that? Really, our our process for picking locations at the beginning was twofold. The first was from the historical perspective. Um, all of us really strive to bring forth the hyster the historical narrative of these locations. So to just really visit them for their historical stories is one of the factors which drove us to pick the locations that we chose, right? Because not many people could say that they've spent the night in the St. Augustine Lighthouse or in Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum or something like that. So that's really the, the main motivating factor behind the locations that we go to. The second factor was, um, you know, we, we really wanted to build, in the beginning, we really wanted to build our portfolio in the paranormal community. And we felt that going to these locations that are reported to be, you know, very haunted, have a very rich historical background, um, but also have that paranormal uh, uh, aspect as well. We really wanted to to kind of show the community that we, we're visiting these locations. We're using techniques that may be a little bit different from other teams that are out there. We're an all-female team. And that's really what the driving factor, the initial driving factor was uh, behind the, the first couple of locations that we went to. And then, like I said, as you experience them and you get to tell the historical story, I mean, if you go to our website and you watch any of our videos, the the first four or five minutes of each of the videos is that historical narrative because we feel that if we can tell the history and then bring in the paranormal behind that, then maybe we can help with the preservation efforts of these locations. And so that was really our driving factor behind getting into this community to begin with. Ah, you stole my thunder there, Christy. I was going <laughs> to ask you about the his history. Mm-hmm. Uh, delving into that and how much you delve into that. So uh, before you get to a location, how much history, how much are you delving into the history and uh, how are you going about that as a team? We really delve into it pretty heavily before each investigation. And the reason that we do that is because we want that research to really drive our investigation. So the research allows us to formulate an investigation style um, for that location. It allows us to formulate questions that we're going to ask. It allows us to think about trigger items that we're going to take to that location in an attempt to communicate with the spirits. So we take a lot of notes on the research aspect before the investigation. And then afterwards, you know, uh, we'll spend time in libraries, archives, state archive websites, um, you know, the, the Smithsonian website. We go to all of these locations um, to really delve further into that, to bring our audience really with us on that investigation to show them this is why this location is important. These are the historical elements surrounding this location. And then this is the the paranormal evidence, the unexplainable evidence that we captured while we were on that investigation. So we really on both ends of the investigation, we're we're researching the heck out of the, the heck out of the, the locations. Yeah, and I, you know, I think it's important as well because, uh, you know, you know, we're trying to make a connection. Mm -hmm. Perhaps uh, spirits, ghosts, whatever term you want to use at, at a location. Uh, it it is painstaking and requires a lot of effort doing that historical research. I personally, we had people in the group I worked with that did that that sort of thing. So, you know, I do some cursory historical research before I go into an investigation just for my own knowledge, but I don't really dig into it real in depth. Uh, I mean, do you have someone? Are you doing that yourself or who really does that in depth piece? We all we all do before we go to a location. Um, you know, we'll take the time to visit websites, visit the website of the location. Again, look at state archives, um, newspapers.com. We'll pull that up and see if we can find historical records um, about the location. So we all really take turns in doing that. Um, and then we all just kind of, you know, because we're so close, we're always talking to each other anyway. Um, you know, we'll, we'll bounce ideas off of each other. And, and again, it really drives what we're going to do when we get to the location. So, for example, 
example, when we went to Fort Mifflin, uh, this is a, uh, a revolutionary fort in Philadelphia. It was also used pretty much um, through the Civil War to house prisoners, both Union and Confederate. Um, it was used to hold munitions during the, the World Wars, the Korean War, Vietnam. So it really has been used throughout the history, um, the, the military history of our country. And so when we went before we um, before we went, we again did that research and we found out that there was a casemate that was used to hold um, a, a soldier who was tried for treason. It became a solitary confinement cell. And so that allowed us to, um, again, formulate questions to, to try to communicate with this guy. His name was William Howe. Um, and also to take trigger items. So we thought, what would somebody in solitary confinement want? So we took food, water, some cigarettes, and it, again, in an attempt to communicate with that spirit. And because of that, I feel that we captured some really cool evidence there at Fort Mifflin. You know, we were capturing men's voices. We were seeing shadow figures in the moment and capturing them on our video cameras. So um, I think doing the research beforehand really allows you to have a more robust investigation with regard to setting up questions and setting up trigger items. Yeah, there's a, a term and I want to say uh, it's the Singapore theory. And I don't know if you've heard of that term. Uh, it's been mentioned in uh, paranormal circles before, but it's uh, and it kind of goes along the lines with what you're talking about, bringing in something that you're trying to connect with mm -hmm. whatever used to be there. Uh, you know, whether it is using period, period clothing that they use during that time, um, rifles that they use, like maybe if it's, uh, you know, colonial period, uh, you know, you bring in some sort of muskets or, you know, trying to make a connection with whatever's there. But from what you're saying, I understand you've had a lot of success in using those kinds of techniques. Is that correct? Absolutely. So, you know, when we go to these locations, what we're really trying to do is attempt to communicate with what we feel are spirits that had a human existence, right? They lived, they died, and for some reason, they're still attached to this location. And so we treat them as the humans that they were, right? We show them respect, we introduce ourselves, we say we're here to tell your story. And what better way to connect with somebody than to uh, attempt to show them that we're, we're bringing them something that we know they appreciated. Um, one of the one of the most interesting trigger items that we used was at Moundsville, uh, West Virginia, the, the West Virginia State Penitentiary. This was our second investigation there. We we went back about a year and a half after our first one, and. There's a spirit there named, Red, uh, there's supposedly a spirit there named Red Snyder. Um, Red in his life was a really bad guy. He was the leader of the Aryan Brotherhood. He was in Moundsville um, for murder. Um, he murdered several people. Anybody in prison that he wanted murdered, they ended up dead. So a really bad guy. Um, but interestingly enough, he had two vices in life. The first one was tobacco, and the second one was watching Days of Our Lives. So every day they'd wheel a television set into his cell, they'd let him watch Days of Our Lives, and then they'd wheel it back. So what we did is we actually downloaded an episode of Days of Our Lives onto my laptop, we put it in his cell, and we let him watch it for an hour while we did something else in the prison. And so when we came back into the cell, everything had closed down, because I only had a, an hour battery life on the laptop. So everything closed down and we walked into the cell and we said, did you see the things that we left for you? And we got a very audible yes. And then after that, we had a very interesting K2 session where we were going back and forth with, again, the spirit, what we feel is the spirit of Red Snyder. And after that K2 session, I said, you know, we're going to go ahead and go, but thank you. And behind me, a male's voice said, no, thank you kind of like acknowledging the fact that we we went above and beyond to give him what he enjoyed. And so he was willing to communicate with us because of that. And so that's what we attempt to do at each of the locations that we go to, try to make that essentially personal connection, for lack of a better term, with the spirits that are at that location. Yeah, that's, that's amazing that when you have those kinds of interactions, responses, which obviously sounds like an intelligent response. Mm -hmm. I want to get into... Uh, you know, you've obviously been doing this for a while. Uh, there's this uh, a couple of different ideas on types of hauntings. And, and, you know, the first one will be what some would call a residual haunting or just mm -hmm. a loop or playback of uh, some sort of activity. Maybe uh, it's a spirit that just keeps going through the same routine daily at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, walking in the same place at the same time. What's been your, well, let me back up for a second. Then the second one would be an intelligent haunting, which are intelligent interaction, which sounds like what you just described in uh, that response. Mm -hmm. What's been your experience? Have you, uh, have you experienced both the residual and the intelligent? Oh, absolutely. So um, at the locations that we've gone to, we've had the opportunity to experience both. Um, I'll give you two examples of what I think are residual hauntings. Um, the first one really happened for us at uh, at the Exchange Hotel in Gordonsville, Virginia. So this was a, um, a location that was first built as a hotel, very opulent hotel, because of the railroad lines that went through Gordonsville, Virginia. During the Civil War, it was recommissioned as a Civil War hospital, and both Union and Confederate soldiers were taken there. Um, amputees happen. Uh, uh, amputations happen there. Deaths happen there. I think there's over 700 recorded deaths that happened in this location. So it's it's rumored to be very active. And so when we went to this location, um, ha when you go in, it's it's a museum. So half of the rooms there are set up as Civil War hospitals, and the other half are set up as hotel rooms. So you can see both sides of of its existence. And so we had a voice recorder on one of the beds in the, the hotel portion of those rooms. And so during the night, we captured a male's voice saying, I don't know, I'll be back at 430. To us, that's very residual, right? It's either a doctor saying that he's coming back at 430 or um, a, a train conductor saying he's coming back at 430. But it, we think that it, it is something that is residual that's that's going to loop through time, as you said. Um, another residual haunting that we captured was at the Ma Barker house in uh, Ocklawaha, Florida. Now, we were the very first team to investigate this location, and this was the site of the 1935 shootout between Ma and Fred Barker, and who are two members of the Barker Carpus gang and members of the FBI. So in 1935, the FBI tracked these two individuals down to this house, and on January 16th, around 5 o'clock in the morning, a shootout ensued. It lasted about four and a half hours, and it culminated with Ma and Fred Barker being killed inside this house. So when we investigated there, the very first night we investigated, we did a two-night investigation. We left everything to run on its own in the house. We set up voice recorders, night vision video cameras, and then we left. And this night happened to be the anniversary of the shootout. It was, it was uh, January 15th is when we set up the equipment, and it ran through the morning of January 16th, which was the 83rd anniversary of the shootout. When we went back and listened to the audio that we captured during that night, in the room where Ma and Fred's body were found, we captured two voices at around five o'clock. The first one said, Freddie. The second one said, yeah, Ma. The first one said, get ready. And I believe that is what they said right before the shootout happened. So it's, it, and I think it's going to happen every time that anniversary rolls around. It's something that is res, you know, residual to that location. Now, going back to an intelligent haunting, I'd say probably the EVPs that we've captured, probably 65% of them are intelligent, um, where we're getting some type of response to a question that we're asking. Uh, we'll go back to the Exchange Hotel. That same voice recorder that we had um, that captured the man's voice about two hours later in the night, it captured a child's voice saying, hi, this is my bed. And that to us is intelligent because I think it's talking to the voice recorder because the voice recorder was sitting on the bed. And to me, the child was saying, hey, you're on my bed. This is my bed. Um, so that is a, a, an example of an intelligent haunting. And we've captured numerous intelligent hauntings during our investigations. Yeah, it's kind of like, hey, I'm, I'm ready to go to sleep now. Uh-huh. Off my bed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's unbelievable. And what would be real fascinating there, Christy, is if uh, – you could ever run that same experiment the next year at the same time, same date, same time, see if you capture similar stuff there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that would be that would be amazing if you were able to capture some similar audio that you captured the first time, because that would really kind of solidify uh, that residual haunting kind of theory. I, I personally am still kind of on the fence, and this is just a personal thing for me. I've never really, I guess I've never really experienced anything that led me to believe that something continues to be a time loop, okay. although I'm open to it. And I always like to get other uh, paranormal investigators' perspectives on that, because I know it is something that is commonly accepted within, uh, you know, the uh, paranormal field. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the the residual and the intelligent type hauntings. Mm-hmm. I, I want to get into equipment a little bit. Sure, uh, yeah, absolutely. Equipment. <laughs> Equipment's always <laughs> fun to work with. Uh, I think sometimes uh, you, you can almost, you know, get overloaded with it or overwhelmed with it, if you will. Oh, yeah. Uh, but it's fun to work with. What uh, what have you guys found is uh, kind of your go-to equipment? What do you like to take in every kind of investigation you go into, and what do you not like? Um, every investigation that we go into, we always have voice recorders, and that to me is my number one piece of go-to equipment um, because I feel that EVPs are, to me, the hardest to debunk. Right. So say we're an all female team. So when we go into a location and we're capturing men's voices and we know that there's no men in the area or we're capturing child uh, children's voices and we know that there's absolutely no children on the property. That to me is very hard to debunk and very hard to explain. So we always have voice recorders with us. Even when we're taking the day tours, we have our voice recorders going. Um, We have we each carry a voice recorder and then we have about 12 that we leave in stationary locations uh, on the property during our investigation. So we always have ears on as much as the property as we can during that investigation. So even if we're not in a room, we've got ears in that room. Um, After that, we have our body cameras. um, And that is, again, to kind of show what we're doing in the moment. And that allows us to really cross-reference where we all are on the property during an investigation. So say we've got a stationary camera that captures a light anomaly. I can go back and cross-reference where everybody is at that exact moment, get a timestamp and ensure that it's not one of us. Or if it is one of us, we say, okay, well, you know, that's Jenny walking past the door. It's not a light anomaly, right? So we can cross-reference that. So that's really important for us to have. Um, And also it it obviously gives us a video diary of kind of where we're going in the location. So we use those. We have stationary stationary night vision video cameras that we set up. Uh, We've got 15 of those that we'll set up in different parts of of the property while we're in the location. Um, And then actual equipment, we really like the REM pod. Um, We've got a couple of those, so we'll put those in different in places and we'll carry those around with us during EVP sessions. We do like the K2 meters, so we'll use those. Um, The spirit box, you know, a lot of people think that's controversial to us. We've captured things that were really germane to the situation that we were in on the spirit box. Um, and, and those are things that we just can't explain. So for us, the spirit box is a tool that we utilize. Um, we have an EDI box, uh, EDI plus that we take with us. Um, you know, that is a, a very useful tool because it measures vibration, pressure change, temperature change. It has a K2 meter built in as well. So that's a very interesting little tool. Um, we have laser grids that we'll take with us and set up in front of some of our different stationary um, uh, cameras that we have. Have. Um, and and then again, really just form, formulating ideas for trigger items. Uh, so we we have kind of a go-to box of trigger items: cigarettes, you know, whiskey, water, um, cat balls, marbles, that sort of thing. Uh, and then, as I said before, the research allows us to formulate different um, uh, trigger items when we go to a certain location. So something for Fort Mifflin is going to be a lot different than a trigger item that you take to, you know, Post Town Elementary or Villisca Axe Murder House. And uh, so th- that that really kind of rounds out some of the equipment that we have. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm definitely a big fan of uh, digital voice recorders. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's always good to have video. It's always good to have EMF. That's about it for me. Uh, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the group I've worked in, it does a very similar uh, method to what you just mentioned, and that is to place voice recorders in different parts of the location. Mm-hmm. And uh, sometimes it's two voice recorders five, ten feet from each other facing in different directions. And we found that we've captured EVPs on one where we don't the other. Absolutely. Which, yeah, I don't know if you guys have had that experience, but it led us to believe that perhaps EVPs are directional. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So we've, we've run that experiment. And, you know, for us, I, 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 we're purists to the point that, like I said, the EVPs are the most, for us, the most fascinating uh, evidence that we can capture. The other tools that we take are really to validate 
those experiences, right? So if you've got the spirit box saying some words, that's interesting. But if you've got the spirit box saying some words, when you've got the K2 meter going off and the EDI box going off and you're capturing EVPs, that really just allow, allows you to build a stronger case that there's something going on in that environment that we just can't explain. Uh, so that's the reason why we use a lot of the tools that we use. Yeah, and I, I want to get into some of these locations. So sure. you've obviously, you know, you guys have visited so many different paranormal hotspots. And as I said, uh, many of these are, or some of these are on my bucket list. Uh, you know, the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum certainly is. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been to the St. Augustine Lighthouse. We have, yep. Uh, in Florida. Uh, that's been featured on the paranormal shows. Uh, I guess my first question is, of all these locations you've visited, are there a few that are your favorite and are there a few that have disappointed? Um, well, I can honestly say we've never been disappointed by a location ever. Um, even if we don't capture anything that's paranormal, just the fact that we're in that location for us is an experience in and of itself. You know, as I said before, we've touched the doorknobs in the Lizzie Borden house. We've walked the stairs of the St. Augustine Lighthouse. You know, we've we've laid on the floors in the Velisca Axe Murder House, and not a lot of people can say that they've done that. So not once have we been disappointed with a location. Um, there's, there are some that have been active, obviously more so than others, um, but all of them have been fascinating for that historical narrative. Um, probably the one that is the most fascinating to me is the Ma Barker house, uh, simply because we were the first team to investigate that location. And there was a lot of intricacies about the history of that location, as well as the paranormal of that location. So I really enjoyed that uh, investigation. Um, as far as uh, quote unquote paranormal evidence, um, I'd say Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary is high on our list. Uh, the um, the old Gilcrest County Jail in Trenton, or again, Trenton, Florida, is high on our list, um, uh, as, as well as the location that I currently co-own with my, my business partner, Miranda Young, the historic Scott County Jail in Huntsville, Tennessee. Uh, those are, are very active locations that uh, have just been a, a ball to investigate. Yeah, and speaking of evidence, you've got a, a, a litany of different, you know, videos, uh, audio files on your website. I was really, really impressed. Uh, one, it's easy to navigate. You go right there on the right side and it lists all the different locations you guys have been investigated. You click on that location, you can actually see some of the evidence you've captured at these locations. And uh, just really easy to use, really cool, and uh, some pretty amazing evidence you guys have captured. So um, I was really hoping we might be able to play a few of these EVPs mm -hmm, sure. uh, that you've captured. And maybe you can, before we do that, um, one is the uh, what I just mentioned, and that's the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. You've got <laughs> some cool EVPs you guys have captured there, some evidence. Talk us through the significance of that location, uh, why you really wanted to visit there. Yeah, well, the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum, this is in Weston, West Virginia. And to us, again, it's just a fascinating location. It was built in 1864, and it was really a location that in its in its conception, wanted to have one-on-one -on -one patient to doctor care where it, it was really about rehabilitation of those that are mentally incapacitated. Um, it was built to hold, even though it was large, it was built to hold 250 patients, again, giving them that quality of care. Um, as it morphed into more of a holding facility, if you will, for these patients, um, it really digressed from one-on-one -on -one care to more of experimental med medical care. Um, so you have shock treatments, you've got lobotomies, you've got cold water bath treatments. Um, and by the time it closed in 1994, um, it was, it, it, even though it was built to hold 250 patients, there was almost 3,000 patients in this facility, very close quarters. Um, you have women actually giving birth in this location um, because one of the, the, when you were admitted there, one of the interesting things about this, when you were first able to be admitted there, um, the person admitting you was the person that could, the only person that could get you out. So you have a lot of husbands dropping off their wives that they don't want anymore, saying that she's insane and they would have to have taken her. And so you've, the, the, um, the population there was predominantly female. Um, so you have tuberculosis patients in there as well at one point. So it's a building that's beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, you can really feel the walls saw a lot of 
of sadness, of um, of pain. And so I think because of that, those walls really have retained that. They've retained that element of of sadness and um, and, and really kind of like I said, it really digressed into that medical care. So for us, when we went when we went in, um, there were four Soul Sisters paranormal investigators, and we were joined by our friend Christopher. And um, there were two docents on the property that night as well. Um, and so we went around the room. This was actually our second investigation after the West Virginia State Penitentiary. So we were still rel- relatively new to the paranormal community. Um, so we did set up night vision video cameras. We did have some trigger items. Um, so we covered it as best that we could. And um, there was one part during the night where all of us that were investigating as well as the two docents were standing in one, in one of the downstairs hallways. So everybody that's on the property is standing right here in one of those hallways. And we heard this blood curdling scream from down the hall. And it was, it was so loud. Everything in the building that we had recording captured that scream. We can't explain that. Um, we had some items set up in one of the children's rooms um emily is we we're trying to communicate with the spirit of emily and um so we captured some evps in that room and one point during the night we again we'd asked the docents to come with us on one of our sweeps of the of the facility and the room was completely dark but we had on the windowsill and there's no power on the windowsill we had a glow in the dark balloon we had a k2 meter and we had a flashlight and so we were asking questions and we said can you touch one of the items on the windowsill at the same time the balloon started to roll the flashlight turned on and the k2 meter started going off again just validation that something was manipulating what was on that windowsill so that was fascinating we captured several evps again that we can't explain uh so it was it was a great investigation for us we really enjoyed going to tala all right well let's uh let's give this a try uh okay. you know what Obviously, I'm not working from a studio. We're not real high tech here. <laughs> we had some uh, a little bit of a uh, technical difficulties with Skype here, but um, I'm going to try and pull up one of these uh, video files where you capture some of the EVPs. This is at Trans Allegheny uh, Lunatic Asylum, and uh, I think you've got three pretty good EVPs here. The first one, uh, I think, we'd classify as a Class A EVP. Okay. Uh, you can, you, you know, to me, it sounds clear. You can tell what's being said. There's clear vocal tone. Uh, there's a second and third one there. I think at least two out of the three you can see pretty clearly or hear pretty clearly. Um, I'm going to play this. I hope you can hear this come through. I hope the audience can hear this come through. Uh, uh, for the audience, when you're listening to this, you may want to grab a set of headphones pop them on, uh, turn up the volume a little bit. Uh, This first one you should hear come through. If you can't hear it, please let me know, Christy, and uh, maybe maybe this won't work out, but let's give this a try. Okay. And this is Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. Okay, did that come through, Christy? No, I couldn't hear that. Okay, all right. Yeah, almost like it muted it. Yeah, it doesn't sound like we're going to get the audio to come through, unfortunately. Uh, we tried uh, getting these to actually uh, try to insert the files into Skype, and we had some technical difficulties doing that. Uh, I wanted to try and give it a try to see if it comes through the audio, but it doesn't sound like it's going to work. Uh, there is a very interesting EVP, and uh, let me pull this up again, just the, just the actual text here, because uh, maybe I can kind of give it or you can help give this some context. Okay. Um, it looks like you're setting up in Emily's room, as you mentioned, mm-hmm. and uh, you're talking uh, through some things. And I don't know if you were trying to elicit a response or not. There's a male voice talking, which is obviously somebody working with you. Correct. And then a, another voice comes through and says, sounds female, says, oh, yes. And mm-hmm. oh, yeah. yeah. Clear. Very clear. Yep. And uh, again, if you want to go to the website, maybe you can mention the website, Christy, where people can go on and see this. Uh, if you just click on the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum link, you can find this uh, EVP, but maybe you can talk mm-hmm. about that one. Sure. 
so the website is www.soulsistersparanormal.com and we do have these as kind of what we call quick clips but if you go to the video tab you can actually watch the entire video and you can see the context behind these these evps uh for this one we had actually set the camera down because this is again during our setup and as i said before we're always carrying equipment during our setup and so in this was in emily's room which was the child we were trying to communicate with and we had left the glow in the dark balloon and you can hear as we're kind of getting ready to leave the room you can hear a child's voice saying okay yeah which is again very interesting um and then uh, i believe later on in that clip it uh we said we're gonna go now and you hear a very clear no uh kind of like a directive like i don't want you to leave the room and so that was in that clip also yeah and then at the end of the clip there you've got uh if I remember correctly, somebody asking who was here with us and you get, it sounds like the name Jim. Yes. Yeah. So, and that one's really interesting because when, you know, the docents were kind of giving us a, a, a rundown of some of the quote unquote spirits that were supposed to be in the location and they never said the word Jim, they said James. And so as we were walking, you can obviously see us walking, you can hear us walking and we're going to that location where James is supposed to be um, in one of the rooms, I think on the third level of Trans Allegheny. And so you can hear me ask, what was his name again? And you hear Jim. Uh, again, we they told us James. We never said the word Jim. And so that one was really interesting. Again, it was kind of intelligent. It was like it was following us. So that was pretty interesting. Yeah, and... Uh... It, those two that I just mentioned, one where the name was mentioned and the oh yeah, they were pretty clear. So uh, for the audience, go to the website, pull that up. You can you can play that. Um, the thing about EVPs, Christy, is um, I've gotten class EVPs too. How often do you guys get them? Pretty frequently, you know, for us, and I think the reason we're so successful with this, to, to tell you the truth, is two reasons. One, as I said before, we go into these locations with what I personally categorize as the right intentions. You know, we don't go in with bravado. We don't go in with chest thumping or provoking. And we really legitimately sit down and say, we're here to tell your story. And this is what we're trying to do. Will you communicate with us? And I think when you go in with that mindset and that sense of respect, you get that respect back from the spirits that are there. Another reason is we really sit down and listen and analyze everything that we do that night. So if if I've got 10 voice recorders running for 10 hours, I'm listening to 100 hours of audio. Um, and so I think because we take the time to really listen to that, we capture things that other teams might not capture. And so I, I think, you know, when we go to these locations, we've been very successful in capturing um, EVPs. Now, there have been locations where we haven't captured anything. And again, that's fine because we're we're there for the history first and foremost. But I'd say probably about 70% of the locations that we've gone to, we've captured one or two things, at least one or two things that we can't explain. The next thing I want to talk, the next location, uh, where you had another couple of interesting EVPs recorded was at Malvern Manor. Mm -hmm. And uh, talk a little bit about that location and uh, kind of what you've experienced there. Yes, yeah, so this was an actually an, a really interesting find for us because we were actually in Iowa to investigate the Velisca Axe Murder House. And so um, the entire Soul Sisters paranormal team was there for the for Velisca. So there was five of us there. And um, so we investigated Velisca on a Saturday night. And then Sunday morning, um, Michelle and Cara had to fly back to DC. So it was just Kim, Jenny, and I. And so we were really just driving around Iowa looking for some different places that we could just really visit for a historical study and we came across Malvern Manor and um, the owner Josh Heard just happened to be sitting out on the porch and so we kind of drove up and we started talking to him and he said oh yeah this is this is a very active location it used to be a senior citizens home it started out as a as kind of apartments and then it morphed into a senior citizens home um, and he's like I said he's the owner and he was extremely gracious he said you know come on in take a look around and I explained to him that we had just investigated Velisca the night before and I said we have some equipment in the car would you mind if we did, did a very quick you know investigation and he said absolutely take your time so we were there for probably about four hours this was a daytime investigation which when people say why do ghosts only come out at night this was a daytime investigation 
so um and so like i said there were three of us we set up our cameras we set up our voice recorders um and there's several reports of different hauntings in this location um one of them is a small child named uh inez inez gibson i believe her last name was and so um we had a voice recorder set up in her room and we get an evp during that investigation we get an evp that says i am inez which was again very interesting because it's germane to that event um we actually actually caught a couple EVPs up in the attic as well. Um, we had asked Josh to come up with us and there's a report of a kind of a darker entity that is in that attic and we're very fortunate enough to capture some of, of his words as well. Yeah, there's a couple uh, that uh, you um, mentioned at the end of that clip and mm -hmm. one is actually an expletive. I, I did hear something. I couldn't quite hear exactly that. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the very last one that was there, uh, and I can't remember, I can't recall what it was said, but it was pretty clear to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, you know, a pretty clear EVP. So amazing. Uh, again, for the audience, you want to go back to the website and check that out. Uh, a couple of good EVPs on that clip as well. Mm hmm uh, and, uh, you know, again, I really hope we were going to be able to play these for the audience, but I want to talk about the other location uh, that I was going to play a clip for. And uh, this is another interesting location, Hell's Bar Dam, Tennessee. <laughs> now, uh, this has been featured on paranormal shows as well. I think Ghost Hunters went there, mm -hmm. uh, if I remember right. Uh, one, how did you guys get in there and uh, what did you experience there? Yeah, Hales Bar Dam was actually an amazing investigation for us. We've actually been there uh, several times, um, and really we just asked. So we we went to that location. Um, for those who don't know, Hales Bar Dam was built in 1913. It was in operation until 1962. And the interesting thing about Hales Bar Dam, um, this is in uh, Guild, Tennessee. It it was built in a location that was known to have a curse behind it. Um, so uh, a Native American um, a chief named Dragon Canoe, um, they got into a, a skirmish with the, obviously the Americans, and he said, nobody will be able to build anything on this location. Well, in 1913, the uh, Tennessee, the state of Tennessee decided they want to build a, a dam across this river, and it was fraught with setbacks from the very from the very get go. And so it was an operation for several years, but there were cracks that developed. You know, the turbines wouldn't turn. Um, it, it was just um, really a money suck for the state. So uh, in 1962, they decided to abandon it, uh, and they m made another dam about six miles down the river. Uh, so it really set vacant and. And, uh, paranormal investigators were allowed to go in and so we went in and some of the stuff that we captured was extremely compelling so in this investigation there was four soul sisters investigators um and what's interesting is when you go into the dam there's a series of tunnels that run underneath the dam. Um, and this was allowed to allow people to walk from run, one side of the river to the other. And in the 1950s, school kids used this to, to get to one side to the other. And so there was an accident and a couple of kids were killed. And so when we were down in the tunnels, Michelle had asked the question, um, why are you still here? Why haven't you moved on? And we captured a child's voice saying, I can't, I'm stuck. So that was kind of interesting. And then there was one occasion where it was just Jenny and I, and we were down in the series of tunnels and there was a, a, a junction, uh, kind of like a, a you know, a, a four way stop, if you will, in the tunnels. And so we had voice recorders going down two of those junctions. And so Jenny and I were sitting essentially at that four way stop, if you will. And we had heard a noise and I said, who are you? Can you say your name? And we didn't hear anything in the moment, but when we when we went back and we re reviewed the audio, we captured the name H uh, Hank. Um, and so then later on, I said, can you say my name? And very audibly, we heard Christy coming down that that corridor. Um, again, there was no mail on the property that night. So there's and then, you know, to, to have an intelligent response of my name that we audibly heard and we captured on the voice recorder. That was pretty interesting. So Hales Bar Dam was just a, a really phenomenal investigation for us. Yeah, it would be another location I would love to go to myself. Uh, and uh, speaking of that EVP that you're talking about, where the word Hank came through again, another clear EVP. I heard it without headphones. So again, mm -hmm. if uh, for the listeners, if you want to go back to the website, 
pull up the link, Hell's Bar Dam. You can uh, check out some of that EVP, some of those EVP clips. Uh, amazing stuff. I mean, you guys <laughs> captured. And one of the things, Christy, that's been interesting for me is I've almost never had names. Now, mm -hmm. I've had my name called on a number of loca uh, a number of times. I think on three different occasions I've had my name called where I knew it was not any of the other investigators talking to me. The voice just came through. Uh, it was clearly a different voice. I just don't get names and we ask <laughs> for them often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, what, how have you guys, uh, what, what do you feel like you, cause it sounds like you have gotten names a lot of times oh, yeah. and you've been able to tie those names back to somebody historically. Is that correct? We have, and then we we were able to tie them back to ourselves. Honestly, um, you know, like I said, we got my name at Hales Bar when we were at Old Southern Funeral Home. This was just Jenny and myself. We were investigating this funeral home, which is located in Kosciuszko, Mississippi, and we were doing a spirit box session in the upstairs room of this of this funeral home, which historically was where um, the casket viewing area was. So if you were in the market for a casket, you would go up and they'd have all the samples of the caskets in this large room. So we were sitting up there and um, again, just Jenny and I, and we had the spirit box and we introduced ourselves and we said, can you say one of our names? And Jenny came came through very clearly on the spirit box. And so we had some other interesting words come through and then we left. You see us leave the room. The lights go out. You see us leave the room. And after, right after we cross the, cross the threshold, a male's voice goes, Jenny, in the room. Um, so twice in that same EVP session, we captured the name Jenny. Um, but yeah, for us, we've we've been very fortunate to capture some different names. Um, we were at Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary, and uh, there was an individual there named Jack Jett who was supposed to have been killed, or he was killed, in the prison when that was a prison. We did capture that name um, during our EVP sessions. Um, I'm trying to think uh, what other locations we've captured names at. Um, I haven't released the video yet, but Post Town Elementary, we did capture a name there. Um, so yeah, we've, we've been, like I said, pretty fortunate to capture some names. Yeah, I unfortunately I wish I could say the same during my the course of my investigations. Captured a lot of interesting um, intelligent responses. Mm -hmm. uh, it just names just seem to elude us most of the time. And so yeah, that's great that you've been able to. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps there's some things that you guys are doing that you know, allows you to make that right connection to get that. And uh, so that's great. Talk about, so you visit a lot of great locations, especially out there on the East Coast. Uh, what's on the bucket list? What are you planning to visit still? Uh, well, actually, this next week, which will be this next Sunday, uh, Jenny and I will be at the USS North Carolina. So she will, she and I will be investigating that battleship. Uh, very uh, excited to have that uh, investigation upcoming. Um, and then really, you know, as I said before, Miranda, Miranda Young and I, uh, Miranda is the ghost biker from Ghost Biker Explorations. Uh, she's another paranormal investigator. And she and I met through the paranormal community. And um, so last year, she and I opened a location in Huntsville, Tennessee called the historic Scott County Jail. And so this this location is extremely active. Uh, you know, of all the places that we've gone, I can honestly say this one ranks pretty high on the uh, activity that we've captured, you know, during this look at this location, because we're there sometimes, you know, 15 hours a day and we hear footsteps, we hear door slams just during the normal course of a day. And we've had investigative teams come in and explore um, and, and captured some compelling evidence as well. So really, my immediate bucket list is just to, you know, get that that uh, up and running and more established in the paranormal community, get that location established. Um, but Jenny and I also have some other investigations that we have upcoming this year that we're really excited about. Um, there's several paracons that I'll be speaking at, um, as well as another symposium that I'll be speaking at as well. So we're making a lot of, um, of appearances. Uh, you know, going to these paracons, going to different conventions. Um, so we're really excited to really get back out after, you know, this, the whole COVID thing to get back out and really uh, commune with the paranormal community. Great. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to also ask, uh, you know, you get a lot of talk about, uh, especially with the paranormal shows out there, a lot of the fear-based stuff uh, about the paranormal. Uh, 
I think there's kind of a double-edged sword here that, from my perspective is that, you know, the paranormal is now out there. It's more in the mainstream. It's on TV. I think people are more willing to talk about it without fear of ridicule, mm -hmm. you know, the ridicule factor and that sort of thing. The flip side of that to me is oftentimes it seems like it's Hollywoodized and it's sensationalized. Absolutely. Uh, what kind of what say you about uh, that and what you kind of see on TV? No, you're absolutely right. You know, I, I do think it is a double edged sword. I think the paranormal shows have done a really good service to us that it allows people from the general public to know that we exist, that we we are engaged in this paranormal research. But on the flip side, to your point, it is sensationalized. Right. It, you know, for example, TAPS, when they go to a location, they're there for a week filming. Um, they have a production crew. They have a staff. They have a review crew. Most paranormal teams, uh, you know, do not have that. We don't have that luxury. Um, we're there sometimes 10, 12, maybe 24 hours if we're lucky. Um, but then we go back and do our own reviews. Um, so there's not really this instant gratification that you get from a television show. So you've got a television show that they investigate for 20 minutes. You've got 20 minutes of review, and then you've got 10 minutes of evidence review and it's all wrapped up in a neat package in an hour and that's really not what we do um so i think that that the shows do a disservice to us in that manner um and and then also i think it does a disservice in the fact that it it kind of portrays it as dark right because it has to sensationalize you have that darkness element um i.e demonic and i can honestly say that of all the locations that we've gone to we've never experienced anything malicious we've never experienced anything demonic um now granted we don't go looking for those things but we've never had anything that we felt was threatening in any way and as you said we've gone to some of the most reportedly haunted locations in the country and we just don't get that. And I think it, that kind of does a disservice to us as well, because when I tell somebody I'm a paranormal investigator, almost the first question they ask is, have you, have you seen a demon? No, we haven't, because um, that's not that's not what we do. And so you got to kind of explain it to them. And so I think, again, that's a disservice. But otherwise, you know, if 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 the paranormal uh, TV shows, if that's how they build their audience base and that's what they want to portray themselves as, God bless them. But that's not what Soul Sisters Paranormal does. Yeah, thank you for saying that. I appreciate that because, uh, yeah, there is a lot of that out there. And uh, I, I have to second what you just said and that I have not experienced that either. Uh, and, uh, yeah, of course we're not going to, you know, you don't go, go out there trying to trench up stuff that, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, if that's not what you want to experience. Don't, you probably shouldn't be going out there trying to trench that kind of stuff up, mm -hmm. but I, I've never experienced it. Uh, my experiences have all been positive for the most part. Um, mm -hmm. has there ever been an experience that's really startled you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you can't go into some place like Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary or the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum and not be startled. Um, but for us, it's fascinating, right, to know that you've controlled for all the environmental factors that you can control for, yet you've got a door slamming or you have footsteps running at you so loudly through the darkness that you think something's going to materialize. To that, for us, that's fascinating. So, you have that moment of trepidation where the hair stand up on the back of your neck and, and you think, what the heck am I doing? But I can honestly say we've never run out of a location. Um, we've always kind of gone toward the noise to see if we can find an explanation for it. Sure. Yeah. It's uh, let's get the voice recorder over there. Let's let's get the camera over there and see if we can capture evidence of this thing. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, you'll have some people so fearful of this, you know, we brought guests in and uh, you know, there have been times when people have ran out of the building and, you know, we're all standing around going, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> so right. perhaps maybe some people bring that fear-based energy into it and, uh, they, you know, they've already kind of set themselves up for that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, have, have you had experience with people you have brought in who have kind of brought that kind of energy into a relationship? Yeah, absolutely. So at the historic Scott County Jail, again, which Miranda and I uh, co-own there in Huntsville, Tennessee, um, we actually lead um, open ghost hunts. So we have nights where the general public can book tickets and they can go with us 
on a guided ghost hunt, right? So we bring out our equipment. We're there for about three or four hours and we kind of show them what we do. And then we have EVP sessions. We have different um, sessions where we sit with our equipment and a lot of them come in and they do have that different mindset based on what they've seen on television. Um, and we've, we've had some people that, you know, when our REM pod starts going off or the flashlights start lighting up, they do have that fear base, like, oh my gosh, I've got to get out of here. But we say, just, you know, calm down. They're not hurting you. They're doing what they're, we're asking them to do. They're letting us know that they're here. So just just settle and let's continue with this with the with this session. Um, and I, you know, because of that, through what we've been doing there at the historic Scott County Jail, I think we've opened people's eyes to what paranormal investigation is um, and what paranormal investigators do. And it's a really interesting feeling. I, I absolutely love what we've done there um, at the jail. Yeah, and it, just one more question I wanted to uh, <clears throat> ask, because I know we're finishing up here. We're just getting ready to wrap up. Any you or any of your group members, any physical attacks, scratches, anything like that? No, we haven't. And and I think one of the reasons why is, you know, when we go in with that level of respect, we also set our boundaries. Um, so we'll go in, we'll say a prayer of protection before we go into the location. And then we say, OK, here, who, this is who we are. This is what we're doing. You're not allowed to touch us in any way. You're not allowed to harm us in any way. And you're not allowed to come home with us. Um, unless we give you permission to touch us, you cannot do that. So there'll be times when I'll say, you know, if you're here, pull my pant leg. Or if it's a child, you know, if you want to give me a high five or something like that. So we have been touched to the point where they let us know that they're there, um, i.e. touch my hand or tug my hair or tap my shoulder. And so we've, we've had those uh, experiences for sure, but never anything where we've been scratched or physically hurt in any way. Yeah, that's good to hear. And it, I think it's important to get that message out to other people that, um, you know, again, with all the fear-based uh, you know, such sensationalized stuff you see on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, do you do you feel like anybody out there really has anything to fear about exploring this kind of stuff? You know, for me personally, I'm more scared of the living than I am the dead. Um, but I, I, I get you've you've got to go in with that respect level, the respect for the spears and re the respect for the location, um, because there are physical fears that you have to face. Right. You you, you don't want to trip downstairs. You don't want to cut yourself on an exposed nail or something like that. So you have to protect yourself that way. Um, you know, I, again, I think if you go in with the right intentions, um, I think anybody can become a paranormal investigator um, if if you have that desire and you want to explore this again for what I feel is the right reason, the respect for the history and the respect for the spirits and really advance paranormal research. Um, you know, if you go in there and, and really kind of go in with bravado or or think you're going to be the next ghost hunter or Zach Bagans, I think you're mistaken. Um, you know, for me, I, I really kind of break it down into three categories, right? So the first one um, are, are ghost hunters, right? Those are those that kind of go in, they want to see if anything's there, but they're really not documenting it or really putting anything out for for you know future study um, then you've got uh, those that are more youtubers or, or tiktokers that want to go in they want to show their fan base that yes yeah, something's happened here they really have no connection with the history um, they just go in do an investigation film it or live stream it and they're out and that's it um, and then you have paranormal investigators who like us go in you do an extensive historical study of the location you have a connection with that location and a love of that location and then you try to connect with the spirits on a very intimate level and that's what i'm the most proud of right because you go in and it's 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 one of these where you're having the connection with the location and you're having the connection with the spirits and i think those are the ones that the paranormal investigators are the ones that are fortunate enough to have those spirits respond because you go in with that 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 respectful attitude yeah great again thank you for 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 saying that appreciate that again christy if you can mention the website again uh for anybody who wants to go in and visit and see the evidence you've captured uh, the the various uh uh hot spots that you guys have investigated if you could just put that out one more time please 
Sure, sure. So our website is www.soulsistersparanormal.com. You can find everything about us on that website. Again, if you go to the videos tab, you can watch all of our full video investigations. Um, we're also very active on Facebook under Soul Sisters Paranormal and also on YouTube under Soul Sisters Paranormal. And if you'd like more information on the historic Scott County Jail in Huntsville, Tennessee, you can go to www.historicscottco jail.com or visit the historic scott county jail facebook page all right great well christy uh thank you for joining me tonight it's been a great discussion uh again uh, great work and uh love the website uh the name love it <laughs> <It's great. laughs> uh you know and, and again you guys have uh, some of the amazing lo locations that you guys have uh, been able to investigate and hopefully get to get out to some of those someday what well, it goes their bucket list some of them and uh pen penhurst is another one i really want to get out to someday if it's even available uh another trip to gettysburg i've been there when i was uh you know before i was involved in the paranormal would love to get back out there someday too so uh mm -hmm. those are kind of so I'd really to be able to go out to but uh again thank you for joining me tonight and uh have a great what's left of the rest of your night and uh keep it keep keep going on with uh, that paranormal stuff it's 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 uh, exciting stuff so all right well thank you so much i really appreciate it and i sincerely appreciate the support all right thank you